Now, indeed, firstly, I want to express my greetings to our, firstly, to our long time, our friend, and this is something reunion. Uh, I believe, I think, the last more than 20 years, uh, a small group, I think, out of our serious discussion, at least I think we made some contribution. Firstly, for our knowledge uh, about reality, external matters, particles, and our inner world, particularly most sensitive inner world, that is emotion. I think hmm, uh, through our discussion, I think at some point seems, I think, become clearer. And through that way, I think our uh, discussion also brought some, I think, the as it a impact ray. I don't know impact or I don't know. Effect. Oh the those people who usually not much serious about our inner world. I think our discussion uh this brought some no, 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 no. Recognition of interest. Uh, uh, in bring some interest. People who normally not much concern about our inner uh, inner world. Uh, not necessarily as a religious matter, but simply we are living being with mind, with consciousness, with the experience, emotion. So naturally we cannot. Uh, I say, neglect these things. We want happiness. Happiness is kind of mind. So the very meaning, because the very fact of joyfulness is emotion or kind, of mind. Mental state. So we must know better awareness about that. So I want to express my deep appreciation to our a uh, long time well, participant, and I must uh, express my deep sort of appreciation and sort of what's the day, kindness. One late uh, Francisco Varela, Varela, and then also uh, Livingston. Bob Livingston. Bob, 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 Bob Livingston. Of course, uh, these are no longer with us, no longer on this planet, but their contribution still remain. So, then, uh, all new participants, uh, this time more people, uh, I appreciate you come here. Uh, not easy to reach here, uh, but in spite of that, really out of your interest, out of your enthusiasm, you come here. So I appreciate. Uh, and I'm sure our new participant Ray, suddenly can make equal sort of important contributions. So, then, what else I should say? Good thing Perhaps I, I may say something. I believe 
uh, whatever sort of object, whether destructive or whether constructive, Oh, whether destructive or constructive, uh, the, whether you uh, achieve satisfactorily <coughs> that goal, uh, much depend on the method. Method, uh, realistic method, certainly you should bring satisfactory result. Even destructive work. Realistic method uh, can be more effective. <laughs> uh, uh, then, uh, now, in order to carry a realistic method, it is very important you know the reality. Now, reality, there is always gap, appearance, and the real substance reality. There is a gap. I think animal. I think their method in order to achieve their goal uh, much based on just appearances. We human beings more advanced. Now, not as of the satisfy, just appearance, more deeper reality. Now, so far, as we call modern science, it's a focusing external matters, try to know the substance reality. So quantum physics, all these eventually found marvelous. Meantime, as I mentioned earlier, everybody seeking a happy life, happy day. That means calm mind, peaceful mind. That's also very important for physical health. Very clear. So, in, therefore, it is illogical uh, while we are uh, satisfied just appearances, but try to know the deeper level about external yeah. matter. So, why not? Similar attitude towards our it internal uh, science or internal thing. So, then automatically, about emotion, are very important. Our life is ups and downs. The, in, in our life, I think the main factor which brings our life too much ups and too much down is emotion. Uh, so, it is logical, it is very important to know the very thing which our life becomes happier, or much stress, much disturbances. So therefore, this is not just religious matter, but this is a matter for a better world, happier world, isn't it? So, so anyway, our work for academic level, but that academic uh, work actually bring to clear the reality. And more, better knowledge about the reality, our method can be more realistic. Through that way, our goal, whether constructive or destructive, can be achieved. Uh, can be achieved. So, hopefully, our finding uh, will not help, because uh, would not let, because would not, because of that, lead, to lead uh, to or help, help uh, those people who are seeking some destructive goal. <laughs> some people who want to manipulate others' mind. 
<laughs> that better knowledge about mind, about emotion, then they may <laughs> use these <laughs> in, in order to destroy, uh, destroy. Uh, destroy the other. <laughs> so that's all. So then this time, uh, they, uh, I want to uh, say a few, a few words in Tibetan. Uh, that day, ジェネリーニョドルトゥヤ。だトレンチェリア。で、テムカゼレ。ちょっけ。ちょっけ。ちょっけ。18。うん、ちょっけ。18人。18人。おう。さだんでべるの人にすんにすんにや。だ、まだ
It's been now uh, 22 years since this series of dialogues began and uh, at the initial stage uh, among the Tibetans and particularly among the monastic members there was uh, quite a high level of skepticism about the whole value of this kind of dialogue and some uh, even among Western Buddhists there was a perception that this kind of dialogue may be destructive in the long run because it might undermine the stability of the Buddhist faith uh, regardless of these kind of attitudes, His Holiness said that he had been very convinced of the value of this kind of dialogue and pursued, and over the years it has become very evident that in fact there is a real value. And through this dis uh, uh, discourse and conversation, not only are there uh, uh, po uh, possibilities that the scientific uh, uh, pursuit can be, you know, contributions can be made from Buddhism, the scientific um, knowledge, but also from the science side, there's a lot of aspects of the scientific insights and knowledge that the Buddhists can learn, which will help expand and, and uh, update the Buddhist understanding of the kind of material world. And, um, and so uh, he just wanted to uh, inform that to the um, Tibetan um, uh, people who are here. And this time, His Holiness mentioned that there are quite a number of, quite a large contingent of Tibetans who are uh, participating in this dialogue. Uh, including lamas and gishis and monastic members, but also um, some members of the laity, young Tibetans who have uh, had um, studied um, modern medicine and other professions that are related to science, and he's very happy to see them um, present here, because um, when we speak of um, this kind of Buddhism and science dialogue, we're not only talking about um, a matter that is uh, of interest and concern to the monastic community alone. In fact, um, even the young lay Tibetans, they inherited uh, a tradition, is Buddhist faith, and, um, and you know, Buddha himself um, 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 encouraged his followers uh, to test his word and accept the validity of his teachings on the basis of their own experiment and investigation, not on the basis of uh, uh, devotion and reverence, and uh, behind this statement lies a certain confidence that the insights that the Buddhist, Buddha has found are those that can st withstand analysis. And so therefore, any insights that can withstand analysis, the more it is exposed to investigation, the more it will be able to demonstrate its strength and richness. And this is in fact what has happened in the case of uh, the dialogue between Buddhism and science. Of course, we mustn't forget there might be some individuals whose approach to the Buddha Dharma may be purely devotional, in which case then they don't have the strength and the depth of the understanding of the uh, Buddhist teachings. Then uh, for these individuals, when they are confronted with the fact that the science rejects the existence of Mount Meru, which is the center of the Buddhist cosmology, then they might immediately get so, so shocked and, and start losing faith. But on the other hand, those who do have a deeper knowledge of the Buddha Dharma will have grounded their understanding upon the teachings of the Four Noble Truths and the Two Truths. And for these kind of people who have a deeper understanding, then they will come to recognize actually as you engage with someone who represents a very critical perspective towards your own uh, um, position, in fact, this kind of dialogue will enrich your understanding and make your own understanding stronger and deeper. So this is something that I wanted to share. And, and although in, uh, the, our explicit aim of this kind of dialogue is to help uh, expand the wider body of human knowledge so that if we have a better understanding of reality, including the mental world, but uh, ultimately the goal of that, particularly from the Buddhist point of view, is to help promote towards elevation of suffering and happiness of, of, uh, of the world. And uh, so through expansion of knowledge, we will be able to contribute towards that. And that's ultimately the ethical motive behind our endeavor. So, so that's all, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> now I'm acting like a student. A student. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> Your Holiness, it's an honor and a pleasure
to be with you this morning. Thank you for having us all here with you today and for the week. Let me begin by telling you just a little bit about myself, since you will be spending quite a bit of time with me this week, perhaps more than you wish. <laughs> <laughs> My name is David Meyer. You may call me David if you wish. I'm a professor of psychology and cognitive science at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. My hometown before going to Michigan was Louisville, Kentucky. I was born in Louisville during 1943, so I'm now 66 years old, eight years younger than you. This is what I looked like back then. There, <laughs> those are my mother and my father. This is what I looked like when I was in high school at the time when you escaped from Tibet to India. I was 16, you were 24. I know that you're somewhat familiar <clears throat> Big change, yes? <laughs> Even bigger now, yes? <laughs> I know that you're somewhat familiar with Louisville. It's also the hometown of Muhammad Ali, who went to high school there at the same time as I did, and whom you have helped to learn more about compassion. I hope you may do likewise for me. Louisville is also near Gethsemane Monastery, which was the home of Thomas Merton who came to visit you in India just before he died. You have, yes, you have visited his grave site in Kentucky about 10 years ago. So you know a lot about where I came from. Also, my mother grew up on a farm in southern Indiana near Bloomington, where your older brother, Tupton Norbu, taught at Indiana University. This is another way in which you know at least a little bit about where I've come from. I also know a little bit about where you came from. I've read some of the books that you have written, such as The Buddhism of Tibet. Very good book. <laughs> Very good. In the year 2001, I went to Tibet and visited Lhasa. I have seen your old home, the Patala Palace. This is a photograph of it that I've taken. I've been to the Jokong. I've traveled to Samye Monastery. I've climbed up to the caves of Padma Sambhava. And I've been in your bedroom at, <laughs> at Norbalinga. I hope that someday you may get to go back there too. Now you've said that you're just a simple monk. Such may be so. But you're also the greatest living famous person. There are ma many famous living people but they are not great. And there are many great living people, but they are not famous. Only a few living people are both famous and great. You are one of them. You also appear to be living, which is very good. You have done more to help humanity during my lifetime than anyone else I know. So it's a unique privilege to be here with you today. I am just a simple professor. 
So please have compassion for me during our meeting. So, what I want to do at first is to describe for you and others in the audience a bit more about the topics for our meeting of this week. The meeting will deal with the topics of attention, memory, and the mind. So, just to make sure that everyone knows what we will be talking about, I will give a few brief non-technical definitions about what I think these words mean. So, for example, attention. I will take attention to be the mental faculty that enables sentient beings to concentrate their perception thinking and judgment and actions on selected important objects. For example, right now, I'm trying to pay very careful attention to you <laughs> and a little bit to the audience. By memory, our definition will be the mental faculty that enables sentient beings to store and recall knowledge learned from past experience for present and future purposes. I assume that both the definition for attention and the definition for memory have at least some similarity what, with what Tibetans would expect them to mean. This is not new territory for you, of course, but at least now the audience will know that we are all on the same wavelength. Finally, the mind. Far be it from me to tell you what the mind is, <laughs> but I will try anyway. So for me, the mind is the complete collection of subjective experiences, knowledge, and processes, including both conscious and subconscious ones, and this is very important for Western scientists, that enable sentient beings to think and act intelligently. Now, I happen to believe personally that other beings besides humans are able to act intelligently as well. The monkeys that you have outside are smarter than me. <laughs> so, they surely have minds as well. And there will be issues that arise during the meeting about to whom does the term the mind completely extend. And we will discuss that. <laughs> Now, attention and memory in the mind are important because, as you already mentioned today, all sentient beings would like to suffer less and be happier. And to decrease suffering and increase happiness requires training the mind. Mental training involves practicing to get control over the attention. And mental training also involves using memory effectively to cultivate wisdom and compassion. So, careful study of attention and memory may help to achieve the goals of all sentient beings. And this is what we wish to do. Now, for the meeting, we have a structure, and I call the... <laughs> You sometimes were saying that uh, <coughs> in this hall you will see tankas uh, hung around, and these are the tankas of uh, 17 great Nalanda masters whose writings are important for the Tibetan tradition. And uh, listening to your presentation, it sounds as if if one of those panditas were alive, they would be making the same kind of presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you are putting a lot 
of pressure. <laughs> so, we shall call this the wheel of mind, and it provides the structure for our meeting. At the center of the wheel will be Buddhism, and we will think about Buddhism the entire time. Around the perimeter of the wheel go various spokes. We start with the contemplative studies, which will be represented here. Also, there will be philosophy and phenomenology, such as interested especially Francisco Varela. There will be developmental science, which children, young adults, old adults like you and me. This will be uh, connected to neuroscience, the science of emotion, which we call affective science, and cognitive science. So in the circle here, are individuals whom you have now met that represent each of these points on the wheel, including the center. And specifically, the center is represented by you. <laughs> you will be one of our experts on Buddhism. For contemplative studies, we have Alan Wallace, whom you have met, and Rupert Geffen, whom you have also met. An old one and a new one. <laughs> Another new one who will represent philosophy and phenomenology is Sean Gallagher, back there. Representing developmental science and also, to a certain extent, uh, neuroscience are Adele Diamond, there, and in the far corner, on your left, is Amishi Ja. For neuroscience, Buddhism, affective science, developmental science, cognitive science, <laughs> and we will see about philosophy and contemplative <laughs> studies, is Clifford Saren, another old one. For affective science and neuroscience, we have another new one, Liz Phelps. And finally, up in the left corner for cognitive science, we have Anne Treisman sitting there, and me when I was much younger. <laughs> so these are the individuals with whom you will be interacting this week. The goals for our meeting we actually have many of them. Uh, I will try to mention them briefly. The first goal, which is the one for why Mind and Life was established in the first place, is to cultivate productive dialogue between Buddhism and science. Our second goal, equally and even more important, is to relieve suffering and increase happiness. Everybody agrees about this. Thirdly, we would like to improve our understanding of the attention, memory, and mental control for training the mind. We want to explore links between attention, memory, emotion, and compassion and try to understand better how they are connected to each other. We want to advance contemplative practice by thinking about developing new types of meditation methods. And we would like to design future research of interest to both science and Buddhism. We would hopefully come from this meeting with ideas for new exploration, such as has taken place during the past 20 years through your collaboration with Mind and Life. Now, these suggestions are primarily for the audience to help them understand the speakers, including both me and later ones. 
please look at the pictures and graphs, but do not try to read all text on slides, because at least for me, that is sort of what I'm doing. And if you just listen to me uh, talk, you will be fine. Uh, listen to presentations and dialogue. If we're, we are talking too fast, please ask us to go more slowly. So, my presentation for today is entitled Multitasking, Meditation, and Contemplative Practice. I need to define some of these words for you. For me, task is a word that means a piece of physical or mental work that is done by using a specific procedure in order to achieve a desired goal. For example, brushing your teeth is a task. It has a goal. This is to get your teeth clean. And you have a procedure for this. You use a toothbrush, toothpaste, and away you go. Solving an arithmetic problem is another kind of task. There are many, many tasks. Multitasking is a word that concerns trying to do two or more tasks by working on them at the same time, which we call simultaneous multitasking, or by switching back and forth between tasks, which we call sequential multitasking. So, here are some everyday examples of situations where multitasking takes place. Parenting children while washing dishes involves multitasking. Being the parent with the children is a task, and washing the dishes is a, in a task. And in the United States and Europe, for sure, adults actually try to do both of these tasks more or less at the same time. Using a cell phone while driving a car involves multitasking. Driving the car, you want to, you want to get somewhere. Calling a friend, that's a different task. Working in a business office involves much multitasking. And controlling airplane traffic and an, at an airport involves much multitasking. In fact, so much that these people have quite a bit of trouble. So, why is multitasking important? Multitasking provides insights into the nature of attention, memory, and mental control. Multitasking is very frequent in modern society. 90% of adults report that they multitask, at least in the United States and Europe, and places like Japan. Over 60% of these people say, there is too much, it is getting worse, so I need eight arms and legs. Furthermore, multitasking causes suffering and confusion, as you can see here with this individual who is completely confused. <laughs> the confusion is so great that in popular American culture, songs are being written about this phenomenon. This is one. My mind's got a mind of its own. <laughs> My mind has a mind of its own. It takes me out walking when I'd rather stay at home. It takes me out to parties when I'd rather be alone. Oh, my mind's got a mind of its own. I've been doing things I thought I never would do. I've been getting into trouble without ever meaning to. I no sooner settle down than I am right back up again. I feel just like a leaf 
out in the wind. And so it goes. And this is the song. <laughs> the singer of this song is a prominent Buddhist in America, Jimmy Dale Gilmore. He has performed for the Tibet House in New York City to raise funds. And he is the performer for this song. And, well, we've had enough of that. <laughs> so, reasons to study multitasking. Suffering caused by multitasking may be decreased by careful investigation. Scientific discoveries about multitasking are relevant to Buddhism, meditation, and contemplative practice. Meditation may help people to cope better with the challenges of multitasking. No, no. So this was just referring to, you know, uh, sometime in the past we had discussions about how some pe individuals are able to switch from one to another very easily without getting stuck. Yes, we will discuss that further. Now, because time is short and I want to make sure you know what my conclusions will be because they will provide later discussion, I will tell you some conclusions now. And then I will present a further material to help support them. So the first conclusion will be that meditation involves multitasking. And I will show you how this can be so. The second conclusion will be that scientific research on multitasking can actually help to improve contemplative practice. Multitasking call the research habit. A third conclusion will be that right mindfulness and right concentration can be understood on the basis of scientific theories about multitasking. Right mindfulness and left to Sunday, right mindfulness left to Sunday, got a temper yanda, and a thing is in yanda, got a number journey, the tandy de langure. Furthermore, differences in people's abilities to meditate may depend on how well they can multitask. Here are a few more major conclusions. Data on multitasking suggests that mixing meditation methods in certain special ways during practice may be especially beneficial. Also, data on multitasking provides tests of Buddhist theory from the Abhidhamma. And multitasking is crucial for collaborations between first-person and third-person research. So, how can this be? To explain how this can be, let me first provide you briefly with some background from modern cognitive science. According to modern cognitive science, the mind involves various types of knowledge and mental processes. This knowledge and these processes can be studied by conducting careful experiments and testing precise theories about them. According to such theories, people have a system of component parts that process information during perception, thinking, judgment, and action. The parts of the human information processing system are connected together 
in a complex organization that has been analyzed and evaluated. This is a diagram of that organization. It is a cartoon. I will not try to explain it to you in detail, but you may see that it has many different parts. They are all interconnected with each other, and in dealing with the external world and the internal world, information is flowing around through the various different parts of this system. And what we try to do is understand better exactly what is the nature of the various parts of the system and the flow of information through it. So... La, la re, re so it reminds, His Holiness was saying, that it reminds the Buddhist model of the coming together of objects, um, then the sense faculty and the perception of Exa consciousness. Yes. Exactly. And in fact, a considerable part of what I will say here is entirely consistent with the Buddhist ideas about these concepts and issues. So, to illustrate, for modern cognitive science, the human information processing system has processes for perceiving sensory stimulation. You know what those processes are, of course. They have been recognized in Buddhism, and they include vision, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and perhaps this one's a little bit special. I will explain. Okay. When you move your body like this, there are sensory organs in the joints that let you know where your limbs are. We call the sense that is involved with this kinesthesis. Kenes means movement. It is either a Latin or a Greek word, and thesis means sensory. He's only just wondering whether there is any exact parallel in the Buddhist model. This is a, a good question. Perhaps we could discuss it later. Meanwhile, there are also processes for moving parts of the body, head, eyes, arms, hands, and so forth, processes for feeling emotions, joy, sadness, fear, and so forth, processes for storing, preserving, and recalling various types of knowledge. In cognitive science, we draw a distinction between different types of memory. One important type of, of memory, about which you will hear more during the week, is called short-term or working memory. This kind of memory and information used by it typically will last about 30 seconds unless you rehearse it to yourself. And this type of memory has relatively small capacity. It is, for example, used when you try to remember a telephone number or when you try to remember in solving an arithmetic problem. In addition, of course, we have long-term memory. Its duration is years, a lifetime. You remember what your house was like where you were born. Its capacity is enormous, essentially infinite. And you use it for things like remembering what you did in Ann Arbor a year ago when you gave your teachings for Jewelhart and Galek Rinpoche. 
Now, long-term memory contains various kinds of knowledge. One type of knowledge we call declarative knowledge. This is about facts, past episodes, meanings of words, laws of nature, like if I let go of this control, it will hit the ground. In uh, your declarative knowledge are networks of concepts that contain uh, related pieces of knowledge. For example, the Four Noble Truths. This is an illustration of a network for Buddhist concepts that are presumably in your long-term memory. We start with Buddhism. You know a lot about Buddhism. You know about the Three Seals. You know about the Four Noble Truths. You know about types of meditation. You know that the three seals include the one about impermanence, the one about no self, and the one about suffering. You, of course, know the Four Noble Truths, paths, cessations, sources, and suffering. Notice that there are connections between this point in the network for both the three seals and the Four Noble Truths. Furthermore, for sources, you know about ignorance and attachment. For paths, you know about right mindfulness and right concentration. Notice how the network is building up. It's like the World Wide Web. You know about types of meditation, shamatha and vipassana. And you know that shamatha is a type of meditation related to right concentration. Cognitive science is able to identify what these networks are like in people's minds and to measure how quickly people are able to recall information from these networks. We know how fast you can go from a noble truth to a particular example of it, actually about one-tenth of a second, except for you, shorter than that, because, <laughs> because you are so familiar. Also in long-term memory is procedural knowledge for using skills. This involves rules about what to do while performing uh, various kinds of tasks. For example, if you were driving a car and a traffic light turns red, then you would know the rule that you should step on the brake pedal and stop. Of course, when you first tried to drive a car, you did not apply that rule and the car crashed. <laughs> or at least this is what is shown in the movies. <laughs> you also know the rule that if China makes you angry, then you do compassion meditation. You have many such rules in your long-term memory. Now, I want to tell you briefly about some major discoveries for cognition and action. We have discovered that learning to perform a task, any task, toothbrushing, solving arithmetic, playing chess, driving a car, involves three basic stages. First, instructions about how to do the task are memorized. I explain to you how to drive. Second, practicing with the instructions creates subconscious rules that can be applied automatically without conscious thought. And third, more practice makes it easier to use these rules very quickly. This is related to a passage that you mention in your book, The Buddhism of Tibet, where you ask the question, how does one practice? And you quote Dram, who answered, cause your mind to become the practices. That's, that's essentially what this shows also. Now, the benefits of practice in performing a task can be expressed 
precisely by what we call the power law of practice. This is a mathematical equation that describes how practice changes the speed with which you can perform a task. For example, how fast you can solve arithmetic problems. What's interesting about the power law of practice is if you look at the speed of performance versus the amount of practice that people have, the more practice they have, the less time that they take to complete the task. And this relationship follows an equation that is very much like what would be found in the laws of physics. So just like physics has very precise data, notice also that cognitive science can have precise data as well. These points fit that curve just as well as ones that physicists have shown you in the past. We do not envy physicists. We feel that we are strong scientists, too. <laughs> so, let me now talk about scientific... David Solnitz was saying that's... Maybe there's a reason why sometimes they call you the soft science. <laughs> Physicists. No longer. <laughs> we are hard science. <laughs> Harder than physics because we know what we are talking about, whereas they do not. <laughs> so, I now want to present scientific research on multitasking, and let me remind you, multitasking involves trying to do two or more tasks by working on them at the same time or by switching back and forth rapidly between tasks. Here are some major facts about multitasking that have been discovered through this research. First of all, multitasking can be studied in the laboratory. We do this by measuring response speed, accuracy, and brain activity. Let me demonstrate. Alan, I would like you to be a participant. Are you able to count from 1 to 10? Yes. When I say you're not like the individual in the song, can you count to 10 or to 1 without thinking twice? No. <laughs> I want you to count from 1 to 10 as fast as you can when I say go. Are you ready? Yes. Go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. He took about two seconds to do this. Now, do you know your ABCs, the alphabet? More or less. When I say go, I want you to say your ABCs from A through J as fast as you can. Ready, set, go. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Excellent. Now, that was a breaking motion. <laughs> so what, how about saying it backwards? Oh, <laughs> much, <laughs> much. So is it because due to lack of um, habituation? He, he does not have the appropriate rules that we talked about previously to do it backwards automatically because he has not practiced that yeah. very much. Come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> now, we will have him multitask. I want you to count from 1 to 10 and say your ABCs, but you will go 1A to B until you finish both tasks. Are you ready? Ready, set, go. 1A to B. Faster. B. No, thank you. D, E. <laughs> um, I've, I've, I'm finished. <laughs> this the is, trial is run. This is multitasking. We can measure how long he would take if he was switching back and forth. Okay. okay, so important results about multitasking have been found. We have found that multitasking is often 
difficult and inefficient. <laughs> But I mean, here the examples, the example you've given to Alan has all to do with the level of thinking. But there might be, you know, a lot of other activities where different perceptual processes are operating at the same time. Yes. Like your arms doing yes. something. We, yes. That's easier. Yes. We will talk about that, actually. So, in cases like this, performance time and mistakes increase substantially. The amount of increase is larger for more complex tasks. Interruptions during multitasking are especially harmful, hard to get back on task. Multitasking interferes with learning. New information is learned superficially, not in a deep way during multitasking. Very important. Very important for high school students who like to use cell phones while studying. Yes. So this, this makes sense because in the Buddhist uh, cognitive um, uh, psychology, we speak of uh, certain types of mind that are paying attention but not registering, not ascertaining. Yes, yes. Multitasking can be dangerous and harmful to your health. Using a cell phone while driving is like driving while being intoxicated with alcohol. Also, it causes stress that may damage the brain and body. Now, we know a lot about the parts of the brain that are involved with multitasking. Uh, because our time is growing short, I will pass through this very quickly and just mention that we do know a lot about multitasking in the brain. We know where various functions that are needed for uh, multitasking get performed in the brain, and we know uh, what these uh, brain regions are doing. We also know that damage to them will be very harmful for multitasking. And in particular, these are just some brain regions about which you will hear much more during the week, and so I will not spend lots of time on them now. Instead, let me move on to mention that people differ in skill at multitasking. M males and females are about the same, but Japanese college students are actually better than American college <laughs> students. We have found this in Kyoto and, and Ann Arbor. This, this might be caused by cultural factors, but there could also be genetic factors. And in particular, we have found in our... Now, so why genetic? It's all in this is wondering. <laughs> well, some people believe that genetics causes subtle differences in the brain. This is possible. We do not understand them yet, but without further research, we cannot rule out this possibility. So more study is needed to know whether there are such... <laughs> so is saying that isn't it the case that in all... He's wondering whether one can actually make such claims about genetic differences across uh, ethnic groups like Japanese and Americans, but <laughs> within one ethnic group, we do see oh. different individuals. Oh. Some are much faster in their yes. thinking, yes. some are less. Japanese who are born in America. Interesting. Also... We need, for a very good suggestion, <laughs> needs to be done. <laughs> so there may be environment. Yes, yes, factor. yes, Language. exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Language? Hmm? Language? <laughs> Yes, okay, cultural more likely than genetic mm. to be explanation. Uh, we also know that practice improves performance in multi <laughs> Maybe because uh, if you're shorter physically, then you can get around much faster. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> also, if you are shorter, you can talk faster. <laughs> 
So we have found that when practice continues, several stages of skill in multitasking are achieved. People get progress progressively better in doing two or more tasks almost at the same time. It is possible to become essentially perfect in doing two tasks at the same time. And this is a graph that shows extra time taken in multitasking as you change the amount of practice that you have had. And you see there is a lot of extra time taken for multitasking after little practice, but by five sessions of extensive practice, this extra time has oh, decreased. To the ton -ton. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it is possible, as you were suggesting before, to become very good at multitasking for certain kinds of tasks. So what? How is this related to meditation and contemplative practice? That's what we really care about. So I will describe an application to meditation and contemplative practice of ideas from research on multitasking. Meditation involves bringing things into conscious awareness for careful contemplation in order to develop right view and to perform right action. Research on multitasking is especially relevant because meditation is a kind of multitasking that relies greatly on mental control. Good mental control is the key to successful meditation. Mental control. The same thing that you have to do with your own control. So let me describe a bit more about the role of control in meditation. Control is the ability to guide physical and mental processes for achieving desired goals. Mental control guides the mind like a driver steers an automobile. Mental control enables us to stay on course while contemplating chosen objects of concentration and thinking about their true meaning. Whoop. It's like what the Buddha said in the Dhammapada. Our life is shaped by our mind. We become what we think. Those who have purified their minds, who have gained self-control and truth, are truly fit to wear the monk's robes. The wise direct their thoughts to the supreme goal and thus gain highest knowledge. So what is good control? The nature of good control can be understood with theoretical concepts developed in a field called cybernetics, and I will explain what this is. Cybernetics is a field of cognitive science and engineering that concerns the design of mechanisms for intelligently controlling the activities of artificial and natural systems. Thermostats, automobile cruise controls, heat, controlling mechanism. Those all are designed with cybernetics. Pioneers of cybernetics are famous scientists and engineers. Maxwell, who preceded Einstein in the 19th century. The Wright brothers, who invented the airplane. And Norbert Wiener, who is a famous, was a famous mathematician at Massachusetts Institute of technology where we had the public first public mind and life. All cybernetics. Now, these are principles of cybernetics for good control. Good control involves sensing and adjusting the activities of interconnected mechanisms that belong to a complex system. For example, an automobile uh, cruise control has to sense how fast a car is going and properly adjust its chosen speed. 
cruise control. Yeah, it's slow. Yeah. 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 Effective, the application would be by, from the cybernetics. So he, we'll, we will yeah. get to this. Uh, these adjustments in, uh, made during control involve detecting and cor correcting errors in the performance of the system. For example, a cruise control must notice that the car is going too slow and increase the flow of gasoline so that it goes faster. The control process uses feedback about the system's performance to repeatedly correct errors. And cybernetics describes how the control process works. So here is an example with cruise control, about which you know. It's the device <laughs> next to the steering wheel. Cruise control works by an automobile driver putting a desired speed into the control knob. That is then the chosen speed, and it goes into a working memory that the cruise control has. Do you remember the computer? Computer, computer. This is computer. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This chosen speed then becomes the goal for the system. Also, the system knows what the current speed is. These two. Uh, things, the, the, the speed that is the goal and the speed that is the current speed, go into a device called a comparator that decides whether or not they are the same. If they were the same, everybody would be happy. But if they are different, then the cruise control must make an adjustment. It detects the error in the speed, the difference between these two, sends that to a controller that controls the amount of gasoline going to the engine. The flow of fuel changes. The car engine uh, changes speed. And the corrected speed goes back to working memory. And this goes around and around and around. And this is how cru uh, cybernetics and cruise control works. The implications of these principles are that Good control involves interactions between mechanisms within a complex system of parts. For example, the knob, the working memory, the comparator, the fuel pump, and so forth. Bad control may occur because of failures in any of these mechanisms and the signals that they transmit. This explains why various types of meditation are initially rather difficult. And I will show you how so in just a minute. For example, consider shamatha breath meditation and analytic meditation. The explanation is also going to show how meditation is a kind of multitasking. So let's consider shamatha breath meditation. Now you know what shamatha breath meditation is. You have done tens of thousands of hours of it. Here are some instructions about what that involves, taken from a book by Alan. I will not give you the instructions because you don't need them. But a cybernetic analysis of breath meditation shows that it involves a complicated series of steps. First, you have to interpret the verbal instructions. You have to relax. You have to start your breathing. Then you have to attend to your breath sensations. You have to memorize what those sensations feel like. You have to maintain uh, your current focus of attention. You have to check your breathing. You have to form an impression of what your breathing is now like. You have to compare your current breathing with your impressions from the previous breathing. You have to decide whether or not they match, they are the same. If they are, then you keep doing what you already were. 
If they do not match, then you have to restart your breathing so that it is, it is proper once again. This whole series of steps is the same as with other cases of cybernetics like cruise control. Conclusion, meditation is multitasking. Why? Because task one is preparing with the instructions. Task two is being mindful in this part of the meditation process. And task three is introspection, checking to see that mindfulness is working properly. One, two, three. What about analytical meditation? Well, my hypothesis is that analytical meditation is like solving a jigsaw puzzle. Do you know what a jigsaw puzzle is? Well, you not only know what one is, but you now own one. <laughs> and there is your own personal jigsaw puzzle, which you may try to work after our meeting is over. <laughs> okay? Thank you. You're very welcome. Meanwhile, David? let's move on with analytical meditation like solving a jigsaw puzzle. This is a cybernetic analysis for it. You have to choose your topic for contemplation. You have to recall pieces of knowledge from long-term memory about your topic, like meditating on the nature of emptiness. You have to fit pieces of knowledge that you recall from memory into a mental puzzle. You have to notice gaps that are present in the puzzle, places where pieces are missing. You have to ask questions to yourself to help fill the open gaps in the puzzle. For example, what is the relationship between form and emptiness? You have to wait for an answer to come to mind from memory after you ask this question. You have to check your breathing along the way. You have to examine the answer after it comes to mind. You have to see whether or not the answer that you came up with fills the gap. You have to decide whether it does fill the gap or not. If the answer is yes, you put the answer into your puzzle and you go looking for other gaps. If it does not, then you have to find a gap again and start all over. Round and around she goes, just like before. Task one, preparation. Task two, mindfulness. Task three, introspection. More, multitasking. Conclusion, shamatha breath meditation and analytical meditation involve identical types of control, even though what's going on specifically is different. Still, same type of control. Another conclusion, the Dalai Lama is an engineer. You said that if you had not been the Dalai Lama, you would have wanted to be an engineer. Well, you do cybernetics of the mind. You are in mental engineering. <laughs> so you do not have to come back again in another life to be an engineer. You already are one. Uh, we're running out of time. I need to go more quickly because Diego is going to pull my ear in a few minutes. Let me just mention briefly some additional important facts. Uh, this analysis can explain why it takes so long to become very good at meditation. Uh, it suggests that having a rich mixture of meditation methods will be especially good, and we can actually suggest what that mixture should involve. Uh, it explains why people differ in how well they can learn meditation, because they have various preferred styles of multitasking. Uh, it can also explain mind wandering, which has been called monkey mind. Uh, we have a whole analysis of why monkey mind happens. Uh, it, uh, I will not go through this explanation, but it does involve multitasking. Uh, and if somebody wants to hear it later, we can come back. We do have connections with Buddhist theory. For example, you have written an entire 
commentary on Kamala Shila's 10 stages of shamatha meditation practice. Our results about skill acquisition in multitasking are uh, consistent with this analysis. Well, what 10 stages? Uh, our research also s supports the proposal that there is a stream of mind moments that passes very quickly during thinking and practice in performance. However, uh, you may find this to be interesting, our research suggests that the mind moments are considerably longer than what has been proposed hypothetically by Buddhist philosophers and scholars. Because when we speak about mind moments from the Buddhist point of view, we make distinctions between two types of moments. One is called so one is called the Chatoji Kejima, which is a moment within which a shortest task can be performed. Okay. Uh, so that is uh, quite gross. Um, and then the other one is called the minutest points in time. So again, uh, for which there are different, you know, opinions among the I see. positions. Well, so which it one might be worth to? discussing these various ideas because uh, we may be able to learn more from the Buddhists about their analysis for the timing of this whole business. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, and that is the conclusion you see here, further collaboration between Buddhist meditators, contemplative scholars, and cognitive scientists may be interesting. There are considerable prospects for collaboration in first-person and third-person research, such as you, Francisco, and the old ones of mind and life have become very interested in. There are, is good news about possible collaborations. Uh, the stability and vividness of attention in skilled meditators may allow various unique kinds of studies. Expertise in meditation provides access to subtle levels of the mind. Uh, and there are many interesting questions for future investigation, such as how long do mind moments last in skilled meditators? Are skilled meditators aware of rapid perceptual and memory processes? Does meditation improve people's ability to do multitasking? Does the time taken to master successive stages of skill in shamatha meditation obey the power law of practice about which I told you previously, the little physics-like equation? What is the ideal amount of time to practice meditation per day? What is the ideal mixture of practices for becoming skilled at meditation? Are the higher states of consciousness realized by Tibetan Buddhism and other contemplative traditions like Theravada the same? How are states like shamatha and the four jhanas related to each other? Bunches of questions. I should also mention, although I won't belabor this, there are some possible pitfalls for this collaboration. Uh, bad news for possible collaborations if one is not careful. Now, because we're running out of time and we don't want to emphasize the bad news quite yet, I'll just show you that there is some. <laughs> and I will close. We can discuss the, the, the difficult questions later. I, uh, I want to mention a few other difficult questions that get raised because of this cybernetic... <laughs> so, but we will touch upon those later. If you yeah, wish. Okay. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you wish, we may touch on bad news. Oh, yeah, that's very important. <laughs> yes. I, I agree. Otherwise, I would not have mentioned the bad news. <laughs>
active, also Lord Zhuo Xia, the ninth Xia. That is, there is in fact an established tradition in the Buddhist expositional system as well, where of course, um, what are the pitfalls are explicitly discussed. Yes. I would like to close with a few more difficult questions. This is speculation. You may enjoy it. Please take it uh, with appropriate intent from me. Is an automobile cruise control conscious? <laughs> Is a robot a sentient being? Can computers have emotions and other kinds of subjective experiences? Are the internet and world wide web aware of what is happening on Earth and in the universe? And let me explain this one. Might the Gaia hypothesis be correct? The Gaia hypothesis... <laughs> the, the, this is the notion that the entire planet is conscious and is a conscious being. <laughs> Would the Buddha care about all of this? If so, then how should we be treating computers, robots, the internet, and our Mother Earth? Should it be discussed in a new book by His Holiness called More Ethics for the New Millennium? Namaste. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. So I would like people to remember that in 15 minutes we're going to be back. We're going to start at half past again. And... Thank you so much for being here. And the tea is going to be out to the back door, and you'll see a, a large hall where the tea will be served. So please rem rem remember to come back in time. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, David. Um, one of the questions that we would like to start this uh, discussion with is this idea, and maybe your holiness could put on the microphone, is the whole idea of this law of practice. Um, in, as David Meyer was very clearly presenting, there is obviously a strong effect of the law of practice, that it even can be measured in numbers, it can be calculated how many efforts it takes to uh, dominate or be in better control of a certain task. And we know that this is also true for, obviously, meditation. Uh, do you, in the Buddhist tradition, have such an idea of the law of practice? And is it also possible to measure the effect of these effects? of the practice. When I say, when I say, when I say, when I so listening to David's presentation and the reference to the, the power of the law of practice, um, His Holiness was saying that it uh, uh, reminded me him of the certain understanding of processes of development uh, in relation to, for example, the shamatha practice in the Buddhist uh, context. For example, uh, when we are cultivating single-pointedness of mind um, in shamatha meditation, uh, one speaks of the applications of uh, uh, six uh, forces and uh, um, four uh, types of attention and so on, and then the nine stages of uh, attentional development. Um, there, there is a recognition of a, uh, a process by which one learns to acquire different stages of this development. Um, and then also from the point of view of the actual 
uh, achievement, attainment on the part of the individual, uh, there is also um, uh, the idea of uh, three levels of understanding. Initially, understanding and experience at the level of uh, study and, and hearing and learning, and then moving on to the level of... Uh, uh, instruction. So you talked about... So you have the level of instruction, so which is like the, the, the Buddhist equivalent would be the level of understanding derived from hearing and study. And then you have uh, uh, understanding derived from... Uh, and then you spoke about how you need to then compare it against you know, long-term memory and whether or not it fits with the memory and so on. So that would be at the level of second level, which is the level of understanding derived from critical reflection and, and contemplation. And then, and then the third stage is when everything becomes effortless. And, and spontaneous. So this is uh, uh, referred to as the level of experience or understanding derived from meditative practice. So there seems to be a parallel there. And the very word meditation here has the connotation of familiarization. So once you get clarity through thinking, critical, critical reflection, then you enter into the phase of meditation, understanding arising from meditation, and this is closely related to the whole notion of familiarization. It just gets easy. You slip right into it. So I have a question then. Okay. Let's suppose you have become very skilled at analytic meditation, but now I give you an entirely new topic, such as is a thermostat or a cruise control conscious, or is a, does a robot have feelings, and you now do analytical, no. you, you now do analytical meditation on that. Will it be equally easy even though it's a brand new topic or will you have to uh, in effect start over okay. 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 So David, um, I rephrase the question. Um, would it be fair to say that your question is that if someone has a skilled analytic meditation, uh, kind of, you know... Um, analytic ability. Yeah, ability. And then if he or she would apply it to a totally new topic, uh, compared to an untrained person, will that person be more faster? And Is yes. that the question? Yes. Oh. That, that was exactly the question. The John Dagi Kajusari... Generally, um, when in the Buddhist context, now here we are actually talking about the application of intelligence, applying in the fact that So in relation to the point you talked about multitasking, how fast you can you know, direct your attention and so on. So uh, from the Buddhist point of view, this relates to uh, an application of the faculty of intelligence. And when we speak about intelligence uh, in the Buddhist tradition, we speak of swift intelligence, uh, uh, penetrating intelligence, uh, and, and um, oh, vast, vast. Yeah, vast intelligence. Breath, breath. Um, breath. Um, and then uh, Nua, uh, swift, depth. Uh, depth. Oh. And he said penetrating was really clarity, the sure uh. clarity of your intelligence. Yeah. 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 Sure, sell. That 
One who's able to really encompass a lot within within the field, the uh, and then comes the clear intelligence, which is able to really see the distinctions, um, and then the swift intelligence, where you are able to actually move fast, and, and then the penetrating intelligence, where you are able to actually go deeper and deeper. What are the relationships between these types of intelligence? Are they highly? Correlated with each that other. So here, his holiness feels that it may have some genetic, oh. you know, differences in the individuals. May oh, have different. So in you see individuals who have, uh, the quality of vastness, and then you see you see individuals who have uh, the quality of vastness, comprehensiveness, and also clear, uh, but not very quick. Oh, oh, yeah, because. Uh, <laughs> Some people have the opposite problem. They are too swift, then they make reach hasty conclusions, which they regret later. We know some. We know some of those. Ah, music. The Japanese, the Americans, they are also doing that. They are also doing that. Just now. So here His Holiness's own feeling is that um, one cannot make differences based upon ethnic ethnicities among these different types of uh, qualities. But within one ethnic group, uh, one will see differences which may have probably a lot to do with genetic difference, uh, and, but also the environment in which they yes. grow and also health. Um, you know, the health of the individuals as health, well. Health is very important, and in fact, mm, mm. if I had more time, I was going to talk with you about your health, because we have found that if you do aerobic exercise where heart rate goes high, oh. at your age, you will maintain your ability to multitask much better. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> to highlight, just bring out one point that was stated that maybe a bit more clarity among these four types of intelligence. His own is his hypothesis, or his hunch is, that if you develop these through training in one area, that it is like a skill that then okay. with greater ease you could apply. So there's a, a, a generali generalizability yes. that one should see that you could take those same intelligence skills, analytical skills, and apply them to very different tasks. If they're not just locked into one field. That's the hypothesis. What about the relations between them? If you work on developing one, is there a hypothesis that the others will also be better? Untested hypothesis. And in calling upon the other monks, silence for the time. Yeah, tell me to share you, you should. Oh, not sure, sir. Actually, the last statement yeah. leads to a question that I was also contemplating uh, in regards to the law of practice. Is it true for any task that we are doing? And according to Western psychology, I mean, we've been mostly speaking about mental tasks, but also some physical tasks may be true. But are there also some mental tasks that, that this does not apply to, that practice really improves? Or is it that you are, maybe intelligence is one of those things, or is it uh, not applicable to that? Would you like me to answer? So, 
the best I can say is that wherever the presence of this law has been investigated under laboratory conditions involving a variety of tasks, including, as you suggested a moment ago, physical ones. In fact, this law was first discovered by measuring performance of physical tasks. Uh, it was first discovered specifically with operation of a certain kind of typewriter keyboard. Not the keyboard on a computer like mine, but a special keyboard uh, that allows you to use multiple fingers at the same time for entering letters. So uh, rather than having a separate key for each letter, you change the patterns of keys that get pressed to indicate one letter or another. And a certain investigator about 100 years ago while studying operation of that kind of special keyboard discovered this law. Other people then tried to see to what extent this law would apply elsewhere in other situations. For example, it was discovered to hold for individuals who develop the skill of making cigars. In England, they used to make cigars by hand, and you could measure how quickly a worker could make a cigar the company owners cared about this because the more cigars made per hour, the more money for the company, even though the worker does not get any of that more money. <laughs> Later, people began asking, well, does this also work for mental tasks? And by now, many dozens of mental tasks have been studied with respect to this law. And with very few exceptions, it works everywhere. The ones where it does not work tend to be very simple tasks, like stepping on brake pedals, shifting gears, where a slightly different law works instead, rather than the graph looking like that, it dives down a little bit more steeply and involves what we would call an exponential function as opposed to a power function. But these two types of mathematical relationships are very similar to each other and I know of basically no case where laws of this type have been violated in the laboratory. Whether they also apply elsewhere in certain kinds of complicated real-world tasks, like solving deep scientific problems such as what is the nature of the space-time continuum? Did Einstein get better and faster at solving such problems and conform to the power law of practice? The only way we can know is to close our eyes and see if we can commune with him, <laughs> which may take a while, <laughs> but it's, it's quite general. Yeah. The reason why I was asking is because one of the statements that is time and again made when people confront in the West meditation for the first time is, I can't practice and I will never learn it. So obviously meditation is one of those skills that definitely depend on applying yourself and practicing. Well, the way in which... <laughs> The way in which I see this power law applying to meditation is that during each meditation session, 
especially with methods like shamatha, where you have an object of focus for the attention, it would, in principle, be possible to know how long and how often during the meditation session you are actually focused on the object as opposed to being focused elsewhere. And what you would expect is that the amount of time spent focusing elsewhere other than the object will gradually decrease across sessions as you get better such that eventually you will be able to spend all of your time in each session on the object of focus. And the question then becomes whether or not this change in the amount of time that you are off task uh, follows the same pattern as the power law of practice versus the number of sessions that you have put into practice so far. Can I ask another question related to this topic? One thing I wanted to bring up is how to bring it back to the topic of attention, right? So as we think about people getting more and more efficient as, at a task, what actually tends to happen is the demand on attention is reduced. So for example, learning how to drive a car, initially it's very attentionally demanding. And as you become an expert driver, it's less attentionally demanding. <laughs> So in a way, we can see this as an increasing ease with which we can drive. I wanted to ask how this might be related to the concept of an increasing ease in the context of meditation practice. Is it the case that as we become more efficient, there's actually a reduction in the use of attention? Are we changing the nature of the way the task is done? Is it, is, it cha is it a change in the awareness or is it, in the, is it a change in the actual um, process and demand on attention? That's the question. Lo Nemůžu Tak Kombayo so, uh, although His Holiness was saying that although he's not very clear about this, but uh, if you look at, uh, you know, take your question in relation to the model of uh, arising of a cognitive 
uh, event um, in the Buddhist Abhidhamma system, say particularly the Abhidhamma Samujaya, a Sangha system, um, we identify uh, five mental factors that are uh, understood to be omnipresent. In other words, they are present in any act of cognition, uh, whether sensorial or mental. Uh, so uh, these five, uh, so there is the intention or volition, chetana, uh, which is what really directs your mind to any object. And then you have um, attention, which selects from the field of your experience a particular uh, characteristic or object or property. Perhaps the uh, initial engagement with the object? Yeah. So the, um, and then you have uh, contact where there's a registering of the coming together of the object and the sense faculty and the, and the perception uh, and the um, cognition. And then there is the perception where, um, or you can say discrimination, um, uh, samjya, uh, where uh, a kind of a certain, uh, the, the actual cognitive uh, ac uh, event, act occurs. You're able to distinguish it from something else. So um, now, in the case of say, and then, it's all. La. And then there is the feeling. Uh, so when there is a kind of a tone, a feeling tone of that experience. So in a very primitive sense of just pleasure, pain, and difference, and feeling just very simple. So in any given mental act, these five things are happening. So that whether it's in the sensorial level or in the mental level. So uh, so imagine that if, with relation to multitasking, someone is driving or whatever. Uh, quite a lot of things are going on. So you may be, your eyes may be looking at something, but physically you are pushing the pedal or something, but mentally you are thinking about something else. So a lot of these things are happening at the same time. So His Holiness is wondering, um, so when something like that happens, um, to what extent uh, the, what is happening at the mental level takes precedence, or to what extent what's happening at the sensory, the physical level, takes precedence, may differ from moment to moment. I might add a, just a brief comment with regards to meditation and why don't we stick with shamatha, and that is it does get easier as one gr grows accustomed to it, so that's kind of obvious, but if in the course of developing along the path of shamatha and it's becoming easier and easier, less effort, if you're becoming more and more mindless, less and less attentive to your object of meditation, then from the Buddha side, uh, and not being scattered, but just not attending closely, engaged, then from the Buddha side we'd say you're falling into laxity, chingwa, and dullness, mupa, and if you continue that, you will achieve perhaps the perfection of stupidity. <laughs> but it will not, you'll not achieve shamatha because the path of shamatha entails an ongoing increasing engagement, an increasing clarity of engagement with the object, so it doesn't have the quality of losing your awareness as you proceed. If you do, you've done it wrong, and it really can give rise to serious mental problems. So how these five omnipresent factors perform may differ from what particular type of uh, mental state you may be in. So if you are emphasizing the application of single-pointedness meditation, then the operations of the five omnipresent factors may be different from an analytic type of meditation where you are primarily emphasizing the application of intelligence and critical faculty. So even though in the basic form the five factors are the same, but how they operate and function may differ from the type of meditation you are engaging in. Uh, yes, it sounds like there are two kinds of practices being discussed. One kind of practice uh, is where I practice, 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 and the steps I take um, become easier, and in the end become so easy that I do not need to attend, mm -hmm. and I'm almost not really aware of how I do what I do. For example, playing tennis, or maybe also, solving... For other tasks. Yeah, for other yes, tasks. Yes, true, quite true. Uh, or or uh, uh, solving a math problem, maybe. I don't know. Experts, if you ask eth experts, they don't always know how they do what they do. But then meditation sounds like a different kind of practice where there's not a decrease of awareness, but the practice is to make your awareness stronger or your attention even stronger. So how, how does that work? That, that sounds different. 
Along the path of developing shamatha, so the focused attention, uh, at the beginning, there's a lot of um, attentional imbalances of excitation on the one hand and laxity on the other. As you develop along the path, then the occurrence and the intensity of these attentional imbalances, hyperactivity and deficit, if you like, decreases until when you become very adept, not having achieved shamatha yet, but out of nine stages preceding shamatha, when you're on the eighth, at this point, neither laxity, even subtle laxity, or subtle excitation arises any longer. You become so adept, so familiar, so expert in the practice, they don't, they don't arise any longer. At that point, you no longer need to break the flow of mindfulness, focus on your object, and monitor, monitor the meditative process, because basically, the job is done. Until that point, when there's still the possibility of excitation or laxity arising, then it's imperative to maintain the ongoing quality improvement that you introduce, you apply introspection. It breaks the flow of mindfulness very momentarily, but this allows you to recognize the, the imbalances when they arise and apply remedies. But when you become very adept, then uh, you don't need to apply introspection. You can really let it go latent, or you set it into equanimity, that basically let it go dormant, and then it's more of a smooth flow of mindfulness. But again, it's very important that now you've become very adept, you are absolutely not less attentive to your meditative object. In fact, you're hyper-attentive, but with a profound sense of looseness, of relaxation and ease, but with extraordinary mental, cog uh, how do you say, cognizing engagement, you're very cognizant of the object, and with a tremendous degree of clarity. <laughs> Uh, so even at the level of mental uh, cognition, His Holiness was saying that the Buddhist um, Buddhism makes distinctions between conceptual and conceptual. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so, uh, to carry on with the translation, um, so... They see the movie from South Africa, because the technology is very important, so she did it, so she did it, and 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 she So, in Buddhism, one speaks of... Luri Sava, I'm going to speak of Luri Sava. 
within the mental cognition, we speak of uh, conceptual stage and non-conceptual uh, uh, cl classes. So uh, at the conceptual level, um, when we use um, you know, um, attention and all of these processes, essentially we are uh, mediated through some form of concepts in engagement with the object. Um, there, how the other mental factors like feelings and attention and so on operate, and how they operate at the non-conceptual state, again, may be different. But uh, he was saying that uh, there isn't any clear discussions of this in the Abhidhamma text in the Buddhist tradition. And maybe, uh, so for example, um, when uh, uh, at a certain point when you are, uh, for example, when you are applying your mind to any given subject of inquiry in a meditative uh, process, then uh, in addition to the five omnipresent factors, there are other five other mental factors so in addition to the five omnipresent factors there are other five factors known as the object determining factors they come into play so these are mindfulness uh, confidence and trust or confidence or trust and the single pointedness and uh, uh, intelligence um, mindfulness and uh, aspiration and uh, um, uh, something called uh, determination or decision. Um, so uh, how they operate when you are at the conceptual level, thought level, or how they operate when you have reached the, the non-conceptual non level may be different, but the texts do not really speak about these things. So His Holiness was saying that maybe uh, with the help of um, you know, insights and the method, methods of experiments that are being developed in modern psychology, and uh, comparing against the Buddhist Abhidharma understanding. And maybe at this point, we should also ask if some of the meditators are willing to articulate their experiences. We may have to write new texts, <laughs> a taxonomy. <laughs> microphone, microphone, you. yellow, yellow. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> Kumjung <laughs> Besonkunde so Kishila was uh, basically um, confirming the point that if you compare to the textual understanding of these processes, there is a clear recognition that uh, the process involves from an initially very effortful activity, uh, which over time, as you go through the various stages, the five parts and the ten stages of the Bodhisattva's levels and culminating ultimately in the ex uh, attainment of Buddhahood, there is a recognition of a decreasing or diminishing of the effort element so that at one point it becomes totally effortless and spontaneous.
呃,那天啊,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,這樣,
in, out, in, out, in, out, uh, three times per minute. And you can see the fluctuations in this which is, particular is, network is engaged. This is while doing, performing a task? No, th th this is when th they are in the so-called rest mode. Rest mode. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering whether Rupert, you would want to jump in because I know in Theravada, you, uh, instead of five, yes. there are seven hmm. omnipresent mental factors. So maybe you could. Yes, yes, yes. Right. yes. Well, Actually, that was what I was going to talk about okay. tomorrow. <laughs> 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 but so, in, in addition to the, they would add. Um, one-pointedness as, as a universe, um, and um, faculty of life, which is a difficult one. So on, so on. So on. Is it Jivendra? Jivendra. As a mental factor. So on. When you put the control layer, so control turns. So they make. That's it. You want to? So the other thing we want to do. The other thing we want to do. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in Abhidhamma Kosha, although uh, a distinction is drawn between five omnipresent factors and five determining factors, all of them are listed as universal mental factors. Okay. So, so, so that means Abhidhamma Kosha is, in fact, more than the Usually, it's weaker. Is it a, Abhidhamma Kosha, is it a, uh, I think, based on a Bali tradition. Bali tradition. Oh. But it's a Oh, within the, yes. Within the, uh, I think, something like that. Abhidhamma Sheikh, yes. There are four major differences. Right. Different schools. schools. Different schools. schools. So maybe a little different. Uh, according to Theravada, maybe. It's, oh, yes. I w wanted to go back, though, a little bit to ask a question about this practice thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, within um, Theravada Abhidhamma, there is an idea of 24 conditions. So when anything happens, 20, up to 24 different types of condition help something happen. One of those conditions that seems very relevant here is what is called asevana pachaya, which means sometimes it's translated as repetition condition. That is, the more you do something, the easier, the better you get at it. Um, so it seems very relevant to this uh, concept. Mm -hmm. I know the, uh, in Abhidharma Kosha, and they also have lists of um, pratyaya, these kinds of conditions. But I'm not sure, I can't remember if something like asevana, this repetition, is mentioned. I, 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 I don't remember. Then the the I I heard the in a Bali uh, Sutra uh, there are about 200 different minds mental factors. or metal factors is mentioned. Do you see that? 200. Not so many. <laughs> uh, around 200 are the same 
So Abhidhamma Kosha list 10 of them as universals, yeah. Before we run out of time, if I could ask one question, David. You spoke of focusing outer and then you put your hand inner, outer, inner. Uh, there's a very common practice in shamatha, many methods, but one practice in shamatha, very common in Tibetan especially, is you create a mental image in the space in front of you, mm. right? There's another practice, many practices in Vajrayana, where you don't simply visualize or create a mental image in front of you, but you create a three-dimensional mandala all around you, and most of it is outside. And so, but just to keep the simple one, for creating a mental image, like my focusing, creating a mental image of a banana on top of your head. You can do. So is that focusing inside or outside? This is an empirical question, yet to be definitively resolved, but in my humble opinion, I would hypothesize that you would tend to get a signature that is more toward the outside. And the reason is because when you generate imagery of that sort, the activity is taking place in the same brain regions as would be activated if, if there were literally an object out there on which you were focusing. And in order to then assimilate uh, and further process the activity that's taking place in those regions, you would want to be engaging the same attentional network if you were literally being stimulated from the outside. That, that's my hypothesis. But it, it's an interesting question because there may also... Because it's also very common to visualize things inside your body, well, like a pearl of, pearl of light at your heart. Certainly that would involve the inner focusing mode, but in order to gener generate this image that is, in effect, perceived as being outside, you're also having to use uh, a certain set of uh, additional processes, that image outside doesn't come about and arise spontaneously on its own. You have to do it through certain kinds of willful action. Unless you're uh, Yeah, exactly. And so uh, to the extent that this additional set of processes in, is involved and it may in effect require a certain amount of introspection, you could imagine that uh, at least during the generation phase of getting the image going, you would have a mixture of these uh, two different uh, networks present, and so it would be a joint hybrid signature that would then evolve into being uh, dominated by the one that's outwardly focused. Thank you. So I think we have a wonderful closing point here. We're going to have an afternoon session, and His Holiness is going to retire for lunch now. We have already mm. half past, at least on my watch. And so, please, thank you very much.
and you can see that it's very engaging and I'm looking forward for the next sessions. One thing, one thing I, I, I just want to, uh, to share, uh, to access. Uh, in previous time also, you see, I mentioned, uh, if, if you use the word uh, dialogue, science and Buddhism, then uh, it gets the impression Buddhist religion. Uh, so, therefore, instead of using that, uh, in, in many occasions I mentioned the Buddhist science and modern science, or science and Buddhist science. But nothing to do with the Buddhist concept, or Buddhist philosophy, or Buddhist religion. Uh, I think the reality also, we are not discussing, or because of the uh, seeking certain so the scientist sort of view about uh, rebirth or about nirvana, <laughs> about moksha. We are not discussing with these things. Uh, so actually we are discussing uh, about is it mind or these things. That means Buddhist science, inner science, yes. like that. Yes. Buddhist science also external things, internal things. Mm -hmm. So this is truly in reality also is Buddhist science. Then secondly, if we use this word, dialogue, science and Buddhism, then other people sort of follow a different religious tradition that may not pay much attention. Because this is exclusively Buddhism, Buddhist. So then our main aim is is a contribution for a better world, better human being. We never thinking or propagating Buddhism. As far as religion is concerned, individual, up to individual. Now, we are trying to create because of that new interest, uh, through that way, new awareness about our inner world, which is our happiness or all these troubles, very much based on that. We cannot ignore that, whether you are a religious person or non religious person. Different question. Everyone has the emotion, isn't it? Oh. So usually, is it no because of the no pay attention, no awareness? How much involvement about our emotion? So naturally, is it they also completely ignorant? Is it to deal with this emotion? So we become slave of emotion, so that uh, all these because of the unthinkable destructions happen like that. So therefore, our basic aim is humanity. So, in that respect, if you use Buddhism, then it's something exclusive for Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So, Buddhist science, there we can invite some Christians, some Islam, because of Muslim, mm -hmm. and naturally some Hindus, mm -hmm. yes, who have some sort of similar sort of what's the I think, what's the, uh, uh, some sort of explanation about, about mind. Of course, this uh, in Hindus, in Hinduism, there are a lot of explanation. And in some cases, uh, perhaps there are more people who have actual experience than we Buddhist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so worthwhile to invite such people. Uh, let them demonstrate. Let them sh let them explain out of their own experience, isn't it? I always feel those who see the Hindu practitioner who live in snow, in mountain, completely naked body. So there must be some technique, otherwise they will die. <laughs> There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Yes, that is, I think, very good. Attitude. That brings curiosity. That brings the desire for investigation. That's very good. So anyway, ignorance is good, useful. Well, <laughs> so it's the ignorance that then gives rise to interest. I, I if we, everybody, truly enlightened, like Buddha, then completely relax. No need any effort. <laughs> I, th I think you made two really very important 
Yeah. Just put it on the side. Yeah. Just, just yeah. put it on the side. Mm. Yeah, is that okay? Mm. Is that working? Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, I, I, I will work. <laughs> 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 A very key point you made was that uh, Buddhism may contribute through its science and be taken seriously by Westerners separate from whatever the religious views of Buddhism may be. And in pursuing the mind and life agenda, it's especially important to highlight the fact that Buddhism has an inner science of mind that's extremely important to take into account for improving human welfare, regardless of whatever particular individual's beliefs about religion may be. And insofar as we do that, everybody will be attracted to the activity because everybody does want to use various kinds of scientific insights to improve the human condition. Hmm? Good. Good. Good.